Section 13 of Thoughts on Art and Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in August 2016. Thoughts on Art and Life by Leonardo da Vinci. Translated by Morris Baring and edited by Louis Einstein. Thoughts on Science, Part 1 Necessity of Experience in Science There is no human experience that can be termed true science unless it can be mathematically demonstrated. And if thou sayest that the sciences which begin and end in the mind are true, this cannot be conceded, but must be denied for many reasons, and firstly because in such mental discourses experience is eliminated, and without experience there can be no certainty. Theory and Practice 2. You must first propound the theory, and then explain the practice. 3. Let no man who is not a mathematician read the principles of my work. 4. In the course of scientific exposition, the demonstration of a general rule derived from a previous conclusion is not to be censured. Certainty of Mathematics 5. He who blames the supreme certainty of mathematics feeds on confusion and will never be able to silence the contradictions or sophistical sciences which lead to an everlasting clamour. Of Science 6. There is no certainty in science where one of the mathematical sciences cannot be applied, or in those sciences which are not in harmony with mathematics. From Leonardo's Dictionary 7. Syllogism, to speak doubtfully. Sophism, to speak confusedly, falsehood for truth. Theory, knowledge without practice. Definition of science. 8. Science is that discourse of the mind which derives its origin from ultimate principles beyond which nothing in nature can be found which forms a part of that science, as in the continued quantity, that is to say, the science of geometry, which, starting from the surface of bodies, has its origin in the line, which is the end of the superficies, and we are not satisfied by this, because we know that the line terminates in the point, and the point is that which is the least of things. Therefore, the point is the first principle of geometry, and nothing else can exist either in nature or in the human mind from which the point can issue. Because if you say that the contact between a surface and the extreme point of an iron instrument is the creation of the point, it is not true. But let us say that this point of contact is a superficies which surrounds its centre, and in the center the point dwells. And such a point is not a part of the substance of the superficies, neither it nor all the points of the universe can, even if combined, it being granted that they could be combined, compose any part of a superficies. And granted, as you imagined, a whole composed of a thousand points, if we divide any part of this quantity of a thousand, we can very well say that this part shall equal its whole, and this we can prove by zero, or naught, that is, the tenth figure of arithmetic, which is represented by a cipher as being nothing, and placed after unity, it will signify ten, and if two ciphers are placed after unity, it will signify one hundred, and thus the number will go on increasing by ten to infinity whenever a cipher is added, and the cipher in itself is worth nothing more than naught, 
and all the knots in the universe are equal to one knot alone in regard to their substance and value. True science based on the testimony of the senses. 9. Knowledge which is the issue of experience is termed mechanical. That which is born and ends in the mind is termed scientific. That which issues from science and ends in manual work is termed semi-mechanical. But I consider vain and full of error that science which is not the offspring of experience, mother of all certitude, and which does not result in established experience, that is to say whose origin, middle and end do not pass through any of the five senses. And if we doubt of everything we perceive by the senses, should we not doubt much more of what is contrary to the senses, such as the existence of God and of the soul, and similar matters constantly under dispute and contention? And it is truly the case that where reason is lacking, it is supplemented by noise, which never happens in matters of certainty. On account of this, we will say that where there is noise, there is no true science, because truth has one end only, which, when it is made known, eternally silences controversy, and should controversy come to life again, it is lying and confused knowledge which is reborn, and not certainty. But true science is that which has penetrated into the senses through experience, and silenced the tongue of the disputers, and which does not feed those who investigate it with dreams, but proceeds from the basis of primary truths and established principles, successively and by true sequence to the end. As, for instance, what comes under the heading of elementary mathematics, that is, numeration and measurement, termed arithmetic and geometry, which treat with the highest truth of the discontinued and continued quantity. Here there will be no dispute as to whether twice three make more or less than six, nor whether two angles of a triangle are less than two right angles, but eternal silence shall ignore all controversy, and the devotees of the true science will finish their studies in peace, which the lying mental sciences cannot do. And if thou sayest that true and established science of this kind is a species of mechanics, because they can only be completed by the hand, I will say the same of all of the arts, such as that which passes through the hand of the sculpture, which is a kind of drawing, a part of painting, and astrology and the other sciences pass through manual operation, but they are mental in the first place, as painting, which first of all exists in the mind of the composer, and cannot attain to fulfilment without manual labour. With regard to painting, its true and scientific principles must be established, what constitutes a shaded body, what constitutes a primary shade, a derivative shade, what constitutes light, that is, darkness, light, colour, size, shape, position, distance, propinquity, motion, rest, which are comprehended by the mind only and without manual labour. And this is the science of painting which remains in the mind of those who meditate on it, from which issues the work in due time, and is indefinitely superior to the aforesaid contemplation or science. Mechanics 10. Mechanics are the paradise of scientific mathematics, because with them we arrive at the fruits of mathematics. Mechanics and Experience 11. Experience is indispensable for the making of any instrument. 12. Proportion is not only to be found in figures and measurements, but also in sound, weight, time and position, and in whatever power which exists. Reason and Experience 13. The power of the projecting force increases in proportion as the object projected is smaller. 
the acceleration of the motion increases to infinity proportionately to this diminution. It would follow that an atom would be almost as rapid as the imagination or the eye, which in a moment attains to the height of the stars, and consequently its voyage would be infinite, because the thing which can be infinitely diminished would have an infinite velocity and would travel on an infinite course, because every continuous quantity is divisible to infinity. And this opinion is condemned by reason and consequently by experience. Thus, you who observe rely not on authors who have merely by their imagination wished to be interpreters between nature and man, but on those alone who have applied their minds not to the hints of nature, but to the results of their experience. And you must realize the deceptiveness of experiments, because those which often appear to be one and the same are often different, as is shown here. Effects correspond to the force of their cause. 14. A spherical body which possesses a dense and resisting superficies will move as much in the rebound resulting from the resistance of a smooth and solid plane as it would if you threw it freely through the air, if the force applied be equal in both cases. O oh, admirable justice of thine, thou first mover! Thou hast not permitted that any tone should fail to produce its necessary effects, either as regards order or quantity. Seeing that a force impels an object which it overcomes a distance of one hundred arms' length, and if in obeying this law it meets with resistance, thou hast ordained that the force of the shock will cause afresh a further movement, which in its various bounds recuperates the whole sum of the distance it should have travelled. And if you measure the distance accomplished by the aforesaid bounds, you will find that they equal the length of distance through which a similar object set in motion by an equal force would travel freely through the air. 15. Every action must be caused by motion. 16. Motion is the cause of all life. Of force. 17. What is force? Force, I say, is a spiritual virtue, an invisible power, which by accidental external violence is caused by motion, and communicated and infused into bodies which are inert by nature, giving them an active life of marvellous power. 18. What is force? I say that force is a spiritual, incorporate and invisible power, which for a brief duration is produced in bodies that by accidental violence are displaced from their natural state of inertia. Origin of Force 19. Force arises from darth or abundance. It is the child of physical motion and the grandchild of spiritual motion, and the mother and origin of gravity. Gravity is confined to the elements of water and earth, and this force is infinite, because infinite worlds could be moved by it if instruments could be made by which the force could be generated. Force with physical motion and gravity with resistance are the four accidental powers by which all mortal things live and die. Force has its origin in spiritual motion, and this motion, flowing through the limbs of sentient animals, enlarges their muscles, and thus enlarged the muscles are shrunk in length and contract the tendons with which they are connected, and this is the cause of the strength in human limbs. The quality and quantity of the strength of a man can generate a further force, which will increase in proportion to the duration of the motions produced by them. Aspects of Force 20. Gravity, force and casual motion together with resistance are the four external powers by which all the visible actions of man live and die. Of inertia, 21. A motion tends to be continuous, 
a body set in motion continues to move as long as the impression of the motive power lasts in it. Can man imitate a bird's flight? 22. The bird is an instrument which operates by mathematical laws, and man can reproduce all the movements of this instrument, but cannot attain to the intensity of its power, and can only succeed in acquiring balance. Thus we will say that such an instrument constructed by man lacks only the soul of the bird, and the soul of man must counterfeit the soul of the bird. The spirit in the frame of the bird doubtless would respond to needs of that frame better than would the spirit of man, whose frame is different, more especially in the almost insensible motions of balance, and since we see the bird make provision for the many sensible varieties of movement, we can conclude by such experience that man can acquire knowledge of the more markedly sensible of these movements, and that he will be able to make ample provision against the destruction of that instrument of which he has made himself the spirit and the guide. Of Inertia 23. A natural and continuous motion seeks to preserve its course along the line of its starting point, that is to say, let us call starting point whatever place in which it varies. 24. Everything maintains itself by motion, and if it were possible to describe a diameter of air on the sphere of the earth, like to a well, which would extend from one superficies to the other, and if a weighty body were dropped into this well, the body would sink to remain stationary at the centre, but so strong would be the impetus that for many years it would prevent it from so doing. Transmission of Motion 25. Impetus is a virtue created by motion and communicated by the motive force to the object moved, and this object acquires motion in proportion to the energy of the impetus. Matter is inert. 26. No lifeless matter moves of itself, but its motion is caused from without. 27. All elements displaced from their natural place seek to return to it, and more especially fire, water, and earth. 28. All matter universally seeks to maintain itself in its natural state. Hence, water in motion seeks to maintain its course according to the force by which it is propelled, and if it meets with opposition, it finishes the length of the course it began in a circular and reflex motion. Conception of Energy 29. Impetus is the impression of motion conveyed by the motive power to the object moved. Every impression tends to permanence or seeks to attain permanence. That every impression seeks after permanence is proved by the impression made by the sun on the eye which regards it, and in the impression of sound made by the hammer which strikes a bell. Every impression seeks after permanence, as is shown in the image of impetus communicated to the object moved. 30. A weight seeks to fall to the centre of the earth by the most direct way. End of section 13